an antique store in London, a remarkable discovery has been made that has thrown light on the bloody end of the Tsars of Russia and the birth of the Soviet Union. Well, it was a, a miracle. We were here at Wartsky, and in through that very door behind you walked a gentleman. He was the most unassuming, unprepossessing individual, but in his hands he had a sheaf of photographs. This mysterious stranger had pictures of a lost treasure made by the legendary Karl Fabergé, a master jeweler and favorite of the Russian imperial court. Like the Romanovs, Fabergé himself would ultimately be a victim of the terrifying Russian Revolution. And one of his greatest creations would go missing for a century, having to survive two world wars and a precarious trip to America before pictures of it finally made their way to London. This has been the target of our dreams for so long that I recognized it instantaneously. But of course, as an antique dealer, your first reaction is no. You doubt everything. But looking at the images and then looking at him, it had to be true. 50 Imperial Fabergé eggs are known to have been made. Could one of the missing ones have finally been found? Of course, we couldn't confirm that until we'd handled the object itself. St. Petersburg, Russia. It was in 1917, in this elegant city on the Baltic Sea, that the story of the Carl Fabergé Company and their legendary imperial eggs came to a crashing end. This way you made them. The workshop's downstairs. We design, we used to design our products in here. The eggs. Not just commissions from His Majesty. A citizen Romanov. Citizen Romanov. It's a time capsule, it's a, it's a portal. I mean, we, in Russian history, we have this fault line of 1917, and each and every one of these pieces catapults us back to that time when there were beautiful grand duchesses, a hemophiliac heir, a mystical Rasputin, and all of these people who were annihilated. I saw them once, the eggs. I was a boy. My grandfather took me to your exhibition. Each one of these pieces tie us back to an aristocracy, um, a religion, uh, a system of uh, governing that's, that's absolutely gone. And they're the only tangible evidence that these people ever lived. He was at Bloody Sunday. Your friend's Imperial Guard shot him. Right here. He was just an old man. I wish I'd smashed the eggs when I'd had the chance. So how had it all gone so horribly wrong for Fabergé and the aristocracy that adored him? And just what happened to the Fabergé eggs? The story begins in the same city where it ended, St. Petersburg. The Fabergé family originally came out from France they were refugees from the um, repeal of the Edict of Nantes. That's to say they were Huguenots, Protestants being persecuted by Louis XIV, and they fled eastwards from there. Carl Fabergé, known sometimes as Peter Carl because he was christened that, born in 1846, schooled in the German school in St. Petersburg. His father owned a small jewelry shop. It was a small jewelry shop, but in a smart area. His father clearly had an eye for Carl becoming something greater than just the jeweler he had been. Fabergé had such extraordinary talent, uh, and his workshop was so extraordinary. The other thing is that he could be considered a foreign citizen. But being foreign in St. Petersburg was not at all unusual. It was a very, very uh, cosmopolitan city. He very much planned his education to give him an exposure to Western art, to some of the great jewelry treasures around Europe. The training that he uh, received when he was abroad with his family, studying the uh, collections of uh, museums in Paris and London, and returned to Russia and at the tender age of 26 takes over his father's firm. In Russia, at the end of the 19th century though, one had to get the attention of the Tsar to really make a name for yourself. And that was especially the case at the time of the autocratic Alexander III. 
Alexander III was so horrified by his own father, who was generally a liberal and a progressive, that he decided to reverse every reform. On the other hand, there was quite a lot to be said for Alexander III. He was almost the only Russian leader never to declare war on another country. He was also an extremely brave and powerful man. Perhaps his major mistake was not preparing his son, Nicholas II, uh, to rule. Carl Fabergé implemented a plan that would eventually catch the eye of this imperious Tsar. He started working on restoring ancient Scythian jewelry, which had recently been excavated from the Black Sea. He works on a volunteer basis at the Hermitage, appraising and repairing uh, objects uh, without invoicing the court. And it all really paid off for him in 1882. There was an exhibition of Russian art uh, which Fabergé exhibited, and what he was exhibiting was pieces derived from those Scythian artefacts, uh, which appealed hugely to the Russian public because they gave the impression that Russia had this art-rich prehistory uh, to compete with anything in the West. That exhibition was visited by the Russian royal family and the Tsarina, Marie Fedorovna, bought the Tsar a pair of cufflinks from the Fabergé stand, uh, cufflinks with a cicada uh, motif. So that was the first uh, time he sold something to the Russian royal family. This brings him favor because in 1885 he's awarded the imperial warrant. Having been awarded the coveted imperial warrant, Carl Fabergé starts work on what would be the beginning of a long line of Easter gifts. The first hen egg. The first imperial egg was presented in 1885 by the Tsar, Alexander III, to his wife, Marie Fedorovna. It's a deceptively simple egg, and I think it's a great microcosm of what Fabergé does so well. It's um, white enamel on the outside, it's a gold uh, yolk on the inside represented, a chicken. You can open it up, inside it you find a golden yolk. You can open up the yolk, and inside that you find a golden hen. Inside was an imperial crown and a pendant. So it was, a, it was, like, it was like a matryoshka, you know, one of these Russian dolls. He was probably wanting something to delight her, something to amuse her. What better way to celebrate 20 years of marriage? and Easter in one, um, and led to a commission, an ongoing rolling commission that lasted uh, 33 years. Clearly that first egg worked, and each year the emperor would give the empress an Easter egg from Fabergé. Famously, Fabergé started to get total autonomy in the designs, and uh, with only three commands, that each gift should be egg-shaped, that each one should be different from any predecessor, and that each one should contain something of a surprise, something that would delight the empress. Carl Fabergé would quickly become a favorite of the Russian royal family. But neither they nor he saw the huge changes which were coming to the Russian Empire that would leave both Fabergé and his incredible imperial eggs in great peril. Towards the end of the 19th century, Master jeweler Karl Fabergé had become a firm favorite of the Russian Tsar Alexander III and his wife, the Tsarina, Marie Fyodorovna. His one-of-a-kind imperial eggs had become a highlight of the Easter celebration. In 1890, he presented the exquisite Danish palace's egg, complete with a surprise of folding miniatures. This was followed by the memory of Azov egg, which commemorated a voyage taken by the future Tsar Nicholas II on the armored Russian cruiser, the Azov, where he narrowly survived an assassination attempt in Japan. The diamond trellis egg, made from pale jadeite, was presented in 1892, and was followed by the Caucasus egg of translucent ruby enamel in 1893. The Renaissance egg of 1894 would prove to be the last presented by Tsar Alexander III to his wife Marie. That same year, the Tsar suddenly fell ill with an incurable kidney disease, and he died at the age of only 49. The sudden death of the Tsar left his son, the terribly unprepared Nicholas II, to take the throne and things got off to a dreadful start when at a celebration of his coronation at Kodinka Fields near Moscow, a stampede killed over 1,300 people. The public at large was not impressed with Nicholas's response to the tragedy. 
he was doomed after the Kadinka Fields catastrophe. He wasn't strong like his father. He wasn't expecting to be Tsar. He was only in his 20s. He had kept an iron grasp on the people. And then um, Nicholas comes along and he's a bit more diffident. To begin your coronation with a mass death of the population is bad. And then worse still, he should go to a ball at the French embassy on the same day of this disaster. So that, uh, in fact, did, did his prestige an enormous damage, from which he never recovered. His strength and his weakness was that he was uh, slightly normal and he, he rather liked normal life. He liked chopping wood, being with his family, and uh, smoking, which he did a lot of the time. Fortunately for Fabergé, though, Nicholas continued the tradition of imperial Easter eggs. And in fact, two were now requested each year. One for Nicholas's mother, the now dowager Empress, and one for the new Tsarina, Alexandra, who unfortunately was just as unpopular as the Tsar. Tsarina Alexandra came from the small German court of Darmstadt, and uh, she was known as the German one. That was a problem for her to get over to start with. Some Russian empresses have overcome this, but she was extremely tactless. She was convinced that uh, Russia should be an absolute monarchy, and she pushed her husband, and she had extremely bad judgment. She didn't enjoy balls and dances, uh, she thought that uh, the Russian aristocracy were, were very decadent. Meanwhile, the dowager had been very fun-loving and was very popular. The, the Tsarina had a hard act to follow and she didn't really manage. The first pair of eggs given was in 1895, when Tsarina Alexandra received the rosebud egg and the dowager received the blue serpent clock egg. This egg would eventually end up in Monaco, where it became a treasured possession of Princess Grace. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip take the royal drive along the superb course. Princess Grace and Prince Rainier are guests. Three other eggs also ended up in royal possession, becoming the property of Queen Elizabeth II. The colonnade egg, the basket of flowers egg, and the stunning mosaic egg. It seems that Fabergé has always been a favorite of royalty right from the days of his very first royal client, the Dowager Empress Marie Fyodorovna. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. You look well, Master Jeweller. I persevere, Your Majesty. Yes. You are a wonderful reminder to the court that our generation is not past quite yet. We persevere indeed. I think Fabergé had an intimate relationship with virtually every member of the imperial family. Their relationships and their loves, their passions, their lusts and so on were expressed through the exchanges of these gifts. So all of the emotions which you know, are treasured in, in them as these historical figures coalesced into these Fabergé objects. On behalf of His Imperial Majesty, it is the great honour of the Carl Fabergé Company to present this year's Easter gift. Maria Fyodorovna was, unlike Nicholas II's wife, she had extraordinary charm. Once she was the Dowager Empress, she was the most respected member of the, of the royal family. The Dowager was generally more charming and outgoing than the Tsarina, and she had established a good relationship with Fabergé. He had obviously prepared the surprises very well. She'd always liked them. Marie Fedorovna, she was essentially the same age as him. She was his original client. She received those original eggs. And there are certainly letters from her, for example, to her sister, who was our own Queen Alexandra here in the UK, uh, in which she said, Fabergé brought the most wonderful egg. I told him you were a genius. Clearly, she liked him. I hope Your Majesty is pleased. My dear, dear Fabergé, you truly are an unparalleled genius. Fabergé's connection with the imperial family was the ultimate cachet, and his workshop was soon producing an array of items for other European aristocratic families. He even opened up an international store in London. That idea of a feudal society, if it was the fascination of the court, it quickly became the fascination of every level of society. The, the aristocracy, the, the traders, the bankers, the entrepreneurs, they would all want to participate in that royal fascination. And it wasn't just in Russia. In England, exactly the same thing happened. Fashions such as um, cigarette smoking came to the fore. Fabergé responded very quickly to this with cigarette cases. When you open this, you have not only the um, case itself, 
and the characteristic um, thumb piece here, it opens to reveal a signature and a date. So this is when a cigarette case is not only a cigarette case, but it's a case that's been um, purchased uh, by a Grand Duchess as a gift. Fabergé is a Russian company and they were made in Russia and they are quintessentially Russian. It does have a distinct English flavour. And I think there is perhaps more Fabergé within a mile radius of where we're stood now than there is in the entirety of Russia and America put together. Essentially, uh, the London shop was started on the back of commissions or requests for objects from the British royal family. And the British royal family had learned to love Fabergé uh, because of the relationship between Marie Fedorovna and Alexandra. Edward VII and then Queen Alexandra, the sister of Maria Fedorovna, they were also fascinated by Fabergé, and as a consequence, English society became fascinated by Fabergé. There's a famous story of, uh, I think he was by then Edward VII, being given a present uh, by a friend, uh, saying, actually, I don't particularly want this. If you want to buy me something, go down to Fabergé's shop and look at, it, look at what he's got. <laughs> Although the 50 imperial eggs are undoubtedly the most desired today, Fabergé did make other Easter eggs for paying customers, including the wealthy Kelch family. If you were a Russian lady of some stature, you would have chains of miniature Fabergé eggs, and then there were eggs in between that were given the size of hen's eggs, and there were various types, which are all marvellous, and they're all wonderful. The problem with making stuff for the Russian royal family was the bureaucracy he had to deal with. He did find it more congenial making objects for the newly emerging uh, middle classes, or very rich middle classes, I should say. Two very prominent European families who commissioned works from Fabergé were the Rothschilds and the Nobels, for whom the Nobel ice egg was made. They were happy to spend what it required, happy to give him carte blanche, and, and to take what he made for them, and he made some fabulous objects for them. Fabergé made two eggs every year during Nicholas II's reign, with the exceptions of 1904 and 1905, when no eggs were presented. During this period, Russia suffered a disastrous defeat in the Russo-Japanese War. 1905 was an especially bad year, with the Bloody Sunday Massacre being carried out in St. Petersburg and the eventually unsuccessful 1905 Revolution. Work on the eggs resumed in 1906 with the Swan Egg, with its automaton miniature. Carl Fabergé had brought his son Agathon into the company, which now had over 500 employees. Nephrite exterior, watercolour miniatures of the children. Father? You can do better. in 1914, Russia was soon dragged in, and Tsar Nicholas II left the imperial court to take charge of the armed forces. In response, Karl Fabergé made what would turn out to be his last Easter gift, the steel military egg. Presented to the Tsarina Alexandra, it contained a surprise of her husband and son commanding the Russian army. But Nicholas II was never suited to being a military leader and Russia was grossly unprepared for the war effort. Once the Germans came to the help of the Austro-Hungarians and pushed the Russian army back, and the soldiers found they had to go into, uh, into battle with no boots, no rifle, and were told to take it off the first corpse they found, then the whole thing fell apart. Once housewives came out of their houses banging saucepans because there was no bread, then the Tsar had to go. The imperial family were offered uh, an exile in England, but all the children were ill. They all had measles. Um, and there was also the thought that the situation wasn't as grave as people were making out. So they delayed uh, their departure. George V, who was a cousin of the Tsar, took away his offer. It was considered safer to uh, take them to Siberia. However, the revolutionary Bolshevik forces led by Lenin managed to capture the Tsar, the Tsarina, and their children, and take them to the city of Ekaterinburg, where they came to a grisly end. Nikolai Alexandrovich, in view of your relative continuing attacks on Soviet Russia, the Ural Executive Committee has ordered that you are to be executed. <laughs> the reason that they were executed was really because 
where they were kept in the Urals, the White Army was approaching, and the Reds feared, perhaps justified, if the Whites captured them again, they would have something to rally the country around once you got the Tsar back. And I think the panicky execution was uh, not due entirely to sheer brutality, but just to deny the, the, the opposition in the Civil War uh, as an important symbolic figure. There's a certain amount of obfuscation about it. I think because um, perhaps Lenin at various points thought it wouldn't be good for him to be named as the killer of the whole family. So there's also a dispute over who gave orders for the Tsar and Tsarina to be killed and who gave orders for the whole family to be killed. Lenin definitely sanctioned it. I mean, the brutality of the revolution, the Civil War, was so horrific that the deaths of the Tsars fit in with the deaths of millions of others who were, who were shot, tortured, drowned, and so on. The murder of the Russian royal family meant that Karl Fabergé's life was hanging in the balance, and his amazing collection of works was in danger of being lost forever which makes the recent rediscovery of one of his imperial eggs all the more miraculous. In July 1918, the Russian royal family was executed and all their possessions seized by the new Soviet state. Karl Fabergé, very much a part of the now extinct imperial Russia, was in danger of meeting a similar end. I saw them once the eggs. I was a boy. My grandfather took me to your exhibition. I had pestered him about it for weeks. Did you have a favorite? In the early 1900s, he built a purpose-built headquarters in St. Petersburg with the shop on the ground floor, floors above that included uh, essentially workshops where a lot of the jewellery happened, although a lot, of, a lot of the other more specialist work would happen in other workshops outside. And then on floors above that, the design studio. One ruble, 10 kopecks it cost to get in. You wouldn't even bend down in the street to pick that up, would you? One ruble. I didn't know that was more than he made in a week. He was at Bloody Sunday. It's estimated that the Fabergé enterprise, well, he had workshops in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. Moscow was where they made silver. Uh, he had shops uh, in those two places, also Odessa, which was a popular tourist destination, and London, which dealt with most of his international business. Uh, and total employees either working for or indirectly for Fabergé, probably about 1,500 at its height. Your friend's Imperial Guard shot him. Right here. He was just an old man. I wish I'd smashed the eggs when I'd had the chance. They had a first stage of revolution, a parliamentary government, but it couldn't end the war and it couldn't continue the war. The officers wouldn't stop fighting, the soldiers wouldn't go and fight. And uh, finally, a small group of highly organized men, the Bolsheviks, uh, understood how to make a revolution. I wish many things were different. Comrade Lenin back in exile, you mean? Bloody Nicholas in his palace. They understood you don't have to have large numbers. You just take the railway junction and the telephone exchange. Once you hold those two, everyone else is paralyzed. Uh, so you could say it was Lenin's uh, and Trotsky's highly intelligent uh, methods uh, for a small group to take over a large country that, that uh, finished that stage of the revolution. You're all looters, war profiteers, parasites! Go in fat while the working man dies! But you don't make the world anymore. to go, citizen. Famously, the Bolsheviks arrived at Fabergé's business uh, to take it over. He said, just give me a minute to fetch my hat and coat, and essentially slipped out the back. 
soon afterwards, he was uh, smuggled out of St. Petersburg. Uh, he ended up in Switzerland, uh, but he was clearly broken by the events of the revolution. He was not placed under arrest, nor was he dragged to Ekaterinburg and shot or any of his family members. So um, his uh, destiny was very different. Um, his holdings were nationalized and eventually found his way to Lausanne, having traveled with his clothes and apparently a collection of wine, and died in Lausanne in 1920. Fabergé wasn't the only one who escaped, though. The Dowager Empress also managed to flee the revolution despite having been a Tsarina herself. She, along with other members of her family, were taken to safety aboard the British battleship HMS Marlborough. George V felt very guilty when he heard, obviously, of this terrible tragedy. He made great efforts to get the Dowager out and the Tsar's sister Xenia and all Xenia's children. The local Reds never got round to executing members of the royal family. They were too much of a hurry defending themselves. And so she managed to get out on a British battleship. On the Marlborough, Prince Felix Yusupov, who murdered Rasputin, had two Rembrandts, and he was seen on deck with them rolled up under his arm. Uh, there was the Fabergé egg, the cross of St. George, down in the hold. And the Yusupovs also had other treasures. 20 million pounds worth of um, jewels and treasures on, on board, so quite an extraordinary amount. The Cross of St. George Egg was the last Fabergé egg presented to the Dowager Empress. By taking it with her, it became the only Imperial Easter egg known to have left Russia with its owner. Karl Fabergé may have escaped to Switzerland, but his son Agathon, who'd become a key part of the Fabergé company, was not so lucky and remained in the now Soviet Russia. I think a lot of the enterprise and dealing within Fabergé's world was conducted by Agathon. And I think he did exactly the same after the revolution as he had done before. And he was a conduit himself for the movement of objects out of Russia to the West. And in fact, in Watsky's ledgers, there are um, references to us buying objects from Fabergé. And the Fabergé was Agathon Fabergé. Agathon Fabergé managed to escape Soviet Russia himself in 1927 but he had left behind one of the unfinished eggs due to be given to the Romanovs in 1917. It was found essentially in the Fersman Mineralogical Museum in Moscow. They thought it was a lampstand. It is actually an egg-shaped uh, bit of polished blue glass on a funny sort of cloud-shaped uh, bit of other glass. Uh, they now know, in fact, that that was going to be the egg for Alexandra Fedorovna. The story of the Blue Zarevich Constellation Egg reveals the precarious times that faced the imperial treasures after the Russian Revolution. Both Lenin and Stalin authorized the sale of many of Russia's greatest works of art to fund the Soviet programs. The revolution brought the Bolsheviks to power. Uh, even if there hadn't been economic collapse as well, it would have changed everything. Uh, economic collapse as well just made it all even worse. There was so much Russian art, and you could ar argue that in fact Russia had plundered all of Europe in the 18th century. Catherine the Great really got an enormous amount of, of stuff from impoverished English collectors and aristocrats. One of Lenin's famous commands was loot the looters. That is to say, all these people who have been uh, living uh, the life of Riley for the last uh, 50, 100, 300 years. Uh, it is now our turn to loot them. Despite the looting, the smashing, uh, the rotting away, uh, there's still uh, the Hermitage Gallery in St. Petersburg can only display a tiny fraction of what it has. Countless works of art were sold abroad, including the Fabergé eggs, and their buyers were a very mysterious bunch. They included Emmanuel Snowman of Watsky and Armand Hammer of Occidental Petroleum. Armand Hammer is a fascinating character, and he was almost the Joseph Devine of his day. Multi-millionaire capitalist who alleges that he is in fact a communist, um, <laughs> and then goes over and makes big deals uh, with, uh, with Lenin. He was not a communist, he was a capitalist through and through. He organized uh, trunk shows through uh, department stores uh, across America and catered to the way that women bought things and made uh, Fabergé pieces accessible to uh, the American public. Ultimately, he became the agent for the sale of Russian works of art, primarily, almost solely, to America. And so he was the conduit from Russia to America, whilst Emmanuel Snowman was a conduit from Russia to Western Europe. A king's ransom in art jewels, gems from the collection of the late Tsar of Russia, on exhibition. 
treasure worth many millions procured from the Soviet government after the revolution. Armand Hammer and Emmanuel Snowman were two of the major figures who had facilitated the movement of Fabergé eggs to the West. But one man who wanted to gather them for himself was Malcolm Forbes of Forbes magazine. He went on a spending spree. Malcolm Forbes was a relative late come, and Forbes was possessed by a collecting mania. He was an obsessive collector, I suppose. Um, the great thing about um, Fabergé eggs is there are only, what, 50 imperial ones and another uh, 16. So you could, you, you could actually get the lot. It was one of those things where you could find you had the complete stamp collection. In a span of two decades, Malcolm Forbes managed to get his hands on nine imperial Fabergé eggs in total. His ambition was always to have more Easter eggs than the Kremlin. He never quite got there, but he got very close. While most of the imperial Fabergé eggs were sold abroad for foreign currency, 10 did remain in the Kremlin armory and have never left the country. And one of the great sort of stories and, and unknowns of these eggs is that we know exactly where they were in Soviet times, we know where they were in imperial times, and we really know where they were once they emerged in the West. The skullduggery and the mischief of those original and first transactions, we don't know. And so I feel as though there are wonderfully sort of untold stories there involving these sort of ravenous dealers and sort of mischievous individuals. Malcolm Forbes' determination to collect as many Fabergé eggs as he could helped shoot up the price of these one-of-a-kind treasures. When the winter egg went on sale in 2002, it was bought by a Qatari bidder for $8.7 million. All done at $8,700,000. Maria, your bidder at 8 million. My favourite egg is one that was given to Marie Fedorovna in 1913. Uh, and that's one of the most striking things about it, is here we are, almost 30 years after that first egg, and you're still getting wonderful creativity. It looks like you're looking through a winter fog as you look through the egg. Uh, it's sitting on more carved rock crystal, which is polished so much that it looks like melting ice. And then within the egg, so you can see it through a winter fog, or open the egg and lift it out, is a little basket of enamel flowers of spring anemones. So you've got a wonderful symbolism there of spring seen through winter. In 2004, though, Malcolm Forbes' collection of Fabergé eggs would make their way back home to St. Petersburg when they were purchased by the Russian oligarch, Victor Vexelberg. Vexelberg, I think, spent something like $100 million getting uh, quite a large number of eggs back. They've gone back to the, um, the Fabergé Museum in St. Petersburg, which actually is a fabulous destination for them. Whatever the mechanism of why they got there, where they have ended up is the perfect home for them. For the longest time, 42 imperial Fabergé eggs were known to have survived the Russian Revolution, with just eight remaining lost. But then, out of the blue, an American man arrived at Wartsky in London with evidence that one of those eggs had been found. Wartsky in London is forever entwined with the history of Fabergé, so it's the only place you would go if you thought you'd found a missing imperial Fabergé egg. And that's exactly what an American individual recently did. In walked a gentleman, and he was the most unassuming, unprepossessing individual. He was wearing a plaid American shirt, the quintessential red plaid American shirt, jeans. He asked me by name, and when I came up, he couldn't actually speak to me. His mouth was dry with fear. There was a sort of like a, like a sort of inability to communicate. Just a couple of years before, a pair of intrepid researchers looked through a 1964 catalogue of the auctioneer's Parker Bonnet, now a part of Sotheby's. Within it, they discovered an image of the missing third imperial Fabergé egg, which had been sold with everyone unaware of its true origin. The only other known image of this egg is from the 1902 Von Dervis Mansion exhibition, where many of the Fabergé eggs had been displayed. But this new discovery proved that the egg had made it to the West, and there was now a far clearer photograph of it. Kieran McCarthy of Wartsky was part of an article published by the Daily Telegraph on this catalogue discovery, which gave some hope that the egg may turn up someday, now that it was proved to have survived the Russian Revolution. But little did he know how quickly that article would lead him to the egg itself.
I went out to America as pretty much as quickly as my feet and the wings would carry me afterwards. We traveled a long way to a very remote part, and I walked into the kitchen of this house, which is a million miles from Imperial St. Petersburg, and sat on a kitchen counter. There was um, a cupcake, and next to it, the, uh, the missing Easter egg. A Google search had proved key in bringing owner and expert together. He had no idea whatsoever that it was Fabergé. He had no concept that this was a missing imperial egg. And so he typed into Google, of all things. He typed Vacheron Constantin and egg. What came up was all of the art historical research which I and Watsky had been involved in surrounding this egg. And so although the miracle of him walking through our door one day it was a miracle, the actual link and the reason why he walked through our door was that research. It proves that these eggs are out there to find. You know, there were 50 eggs. Some of them were destroyed or uh, melted down or disappeared. And uh, we had thought that uh, eight were missing. And until recently, uh, that was the case. And then this, this, this third egg um, appeared. Well, the egg displays every wonder of Fabergé's work. The first is, it's a very simple construction. It's a, a reeded gold egg. But the simplicity belies how difficult it is to make. Each one of these reeds is formed by hand by a craftsman at a workbench. They taper at the same rate to an exact point, both at the bottom and at the top. And when you press the diamond at the front, it opens to reveal the watch by Vacher and Constantin. And this scrolling around the bezel of the aperture where it's there is found on many of them. It's the identical engravings on the cradle with garlands egg. And so you begin to see these little sort of hints of what Fabergé has done before and of how Fabergé's craftsmen worked. And another aspect is when you flip the watch up, it sits which is a beautiful little piece of design which actually allows it to work as not just an Easter egg, but as a clock. And where you really see the absolute tour de force of goldsmithing is not so much in the simple egg, but in the far more elaborate stand. Four coloured gold roses, and roses are an emblem of love. And so the Tsar and the Tsarina, when they saw this, would know that it was an expression of love. And then the lion paw feet, they're beautifully finished on top and they are slightly stylized, but very sort of endearing lion's paws. But when you turn it over and look at the base, the pads and the underside of the feet are as beautifully represented. And of course, the Tsarina would never have seen that because it would have sat like that. This is one of the most sophisticated pieces of goldsmithing if from Fabergé's or anybody else's hands that has ever been created, and it would have been a gift appropriate for us all. But what of the seven imperial Fabergé eggs that are still missing? Well, one of them is called the Cherub with Chariot Egg, and it could be seen in the same photograph from the 1902 Von Dervis exhibition that featured the third imperial egg. Sitting sneakily behind the Caucasus egg, you can see the wheel of the cherub with chariot egg and can catch a glimpse of it in the reflection of the glass casing. This artist's interpretation shows what the egg could look like if you happen to notice another 20 million pound treasure at an antique store. But this isn't the only Fabergé egg of which we have but a faint glimpse. The fifth egg in the series is known as the Nécessaire egg and it featured at a 1949 exhibition of Fabergé eggs in London. London and a Regent Street jeweller has become the setting for an exhibition of the work of Karl Fabergé, that great craftsman of Tsarist Russia. His son, Eugène Fabergé, holds one of the jewel-studded enamel and gold Easter eggs made for the last empress as a gift from the Tsar. Kieran McCarthy, who was instrumental in finding the third Fabergé egg, has also brought us closer to uncovering this one when he found an image of it in the back of a photograph taken at the exhibition. That's one of the most frustrating sort of events in my life. Watsky is an Edwardian company, and our ledgers are arranged that on the left-hand side it shows what the object is. And I looked across where we have the name of the buyer, the address of the buyer, and how much they paid. So I thought, if Mr. Bloggs lives at Four Bloggs Square, I can go knock on Four Bloggs Square and find the egg within. But I look across, and it said, a stranger. And, uh, and Watsky's discretion, as it is with this egg, we cannot reveal who bought or sold this egg. And there is no way of telling where it went. The exquisite work of the man who was court jeweler and goldsmith to Russia's royal house still mirrors the splendor of an age that is no more.
Although the Nécessaire egg featured at this exhibition, it was not known at the time to be the fifth imperial Easter egg. The Nécessaire egg was never recognized as an imperial Fabergé egg, but importantly, it was recognized as a Fabergé egg. So this egg here was never known to be Fabergé, and so because of that, it was never likely to be saved because it was Fabergé, and as a result, this danced on the precipice of the melting pot over and over again. It was sold to almost certainly an English customer, and it was only in 1952, so it is likely to have survived, and that one, I, I feel in my instinct, has survived. Of the five eggs where, where we've got no trace of them coming to the West, it's possible that they'll emerge one day. It's equally possible that they were destroyed in the whole chaos around the revolution. Despite the slim chances of discovery, there are photos of two of these five most elusive Fabergé eggs. The 1909 Alexander III commemorative egg and the 1903 Royal Danish egg. Oddly, we also have the surprise of the 1897 Mauve egg but not the egg itself. The missing royal Danish egg is the intriguing one, though, as it was presented to the Dowager Empress whilst she was away at her original home of Copenhagen in 1903. It's not known for sure if she ever brought the egg back to Russia, so it may be the case that something is amiss in the state of Denmark. You just never know, and, that, and that's partly the mystery of them. And I think that's why this one, this particular egg, is so significant, because it is one of the missing ones. Well, it seems possible that it might be there. Um, she, she wasn't very keen to pass anything on when she was alive, and she used to say, you can have my treasure when I'm dead. So, uh, yeah, it could be, yes. When you know the history, it becomes rather blasé. You know, oh, I know that one, I've seen it there, it was exhibited there and it went there and they paid so much and they did this. It's the ones you don't know about that actually excite the, um, the mind and the fascination. All seven of the missing eggs are ones that were presented to the Dowager Empress Marie Fyodorovna. It's known that she escaped Russia on the HMS Marlborough with the Cross of St. George egg on board. The Dowager took the egg with her, presumably to England, I think uh, then Xenia, her daughter, then Vasily, her youngest son, ended up with it, and then he sold it. But there's no reason why this should have been the only egg she took with her. It's possible she packed up the Empire Nephrite egg and Mauve egg, or any other of the missing ones, such as the second hen egg with Sapphire Pendant. These are the only three eggs left, of which we have no images. But that doesn't mean they're not out there. It's like James Dean. It's like, you know, if, if, they, if Fabergé had carried on and we were now on the 1042nd Fabergé egg, I think they would not have the same appeal. But the fact that it's finite, the, the glory of Fabergé is that it is no more. The reason we've all heard of Fabergé today is because of the eggs. These great, fabulous objects that he started to make for the Russian royal family. They are just so over the top, so wonderful, so inspired in their creativity as well. They're just wonderful objects uh, for combining history and craftsmanship. The extraordinary about Fabergé is the very, very expensive materials used, unique jewels. The, the materials themselves are a wealth beyond imagination. Then the extraordinary craftsmanship, the miniaturization of the work. It's an oriental type of work. It's very, very Iranian, Indian uh, in, in its use of jewelry, its intricacy. Fabergé eggs sort of encapsulate the romance of the, of the story. So much um, care gone into them. They're a product of the social, cultural, financial, political circumstances of that moment. And it's that collision of great craftsmanship and uncompromising patronage that gives rise to this fascination with Fabergé.